So as I've already alluded to today, in looking at the accounts of the triumphal entry, what caught my attention this year was the role of Lazarus, and hence why I kind of extended the reading back and forth beyond the, the account in John of the triumphal entry. Not only was Jesus expounding the scriptures, healing the sick, and feeding the thousands, he raised a man from the dead, which would surely make him a contender for the promised Messiah, and hence a threat to the chief priests. You know, think of polling day coming up. You know, if, if one of us said we were going to stand up and, uh, and uh, with, a, with a strong policy, I'm sure we'd ruffle a few feathers. Also, factor in what he said to Martha in John chapter 11, 25, which is further back. I am the resurrection and the life. My goodness. You know, that would be quite a policy statement in an election. Whoever believes in me, Though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? I do. <laughs> what is interesting is that in this account is that Lazarus also was a marked man. He was a living testimony to what Jesus had done in his life. And furthermore, what is also notable is that even if they managed to kill Lazarus, we later read that also the crowds testify to what happened there. You know, yeah, you kill Lazarus, but the crowd saw as well. You know, what are you going to do? Kill them as well? Lazarus was a threat as well as Jesus. The two of them were marked men. And we can see that being highlighted in the book of John. The Gospel of John reports that Jesus... That, uh, that has Jesus and the twelve, uh, as Jesus and the twelve fled to Ephraim in the wilderness to keep out of sight of the priests after the upheaval caused by the, the raising of Lazarus. So that Jesus raised, the Laz uh, raised Lazarus, and, and the, the group then fled uh, to Ephraim in the wilderness to let the dust die down. And it says in John that six days before Passover, only John says this, the tw Jesus and the twelve depart from Ephraim to visit Lazarus, Mary, and Martha in Beth Bethany. You know, we've read that in John 12, 1 to 3, where a, a large crowd gathered, and they found out Jesus and Lazarus were there. And you might ask, was this the home of Simon or Lazarus? It's quite academic, but Carson probably says it was Simon's house uh, and with Lazarus and his family uh, as the invited guests and servers. Now, picture it. We've already pictured the passion of the triumphal entry. The tradition was for a low table to be laid on the floor and the attendees to lay on their sides. I won't demonstrate, because I don't think I'll get up. With their heads towards the table and their feet furthermost away from the table. And they'd prop themselves up on one side and eat with the other. If you can picture that. So Lazarus was reclined with the, tar, uh, the twelve and Martha served. Given this context, we cannot help but think of the account of Martha and Mary, where Jesus says, Martha, Martha, you were worried and distracted by many things, but only one thing is necessary, for Mary has chosen the good part, which shall not be taken uh, from her. That's it in Luke 10. 38 to 42. And we read in this account in John that Mary lavishes her affections on Jesus by pouring over him a jar of perfume worth a year's wages. I mean, just think of how much money you earn in a year to buy this perfume and say, here we go, we're going to empty it now. That's a pure act of devotion. And the account is symbolic of the preparation for Jesus' burial. You know, they think of the anointing of, of the body after it's died before it's buried. And as we read, Judas protests at the waste. 
but we are told that he was the one used to pilfer from the disciples' treasury. Jesus again defends Mary in that there are, uh, there are times for one-of-a-kind, unrepeatable costs of acts of devotion to Christ. And Jesus, in his final uh, statement here, by, uh, he alludes to Deuteronomy 15.11, where it says, there will always be poor people in the land. Now here again is the point uh, that caught my interest towards the end of that, uh, that section. The chief priests made plans to put Lazarus to death. Why? Because many Jews were going away and believing in Jesus and keeping in mind that not only the Jews believed that um, it was only the Jews that believed that God uh, could raise the dead. So if the Jew, only the Jews could re believe that uh, only God could raise the je dead and Jesus had raised Lazarus, then this was a sure indicator that Jesus was no mere man. You know, as we know, he's fully man and he's fully God, the second member of the Trinity. So that's in, in verse 8. And as we move on to verse 9, which is a plot to... Um, to kill, Jesus, uh, to kill Lazarus. Um, it says, when the, when the large crowd of Jews learned that Jesus was there, they came not only on account of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to put Lazarus to death as well, because of account of him, many Jews uh, were going away and believing in Jesus. You know, and we can look at prophecy and fulfillment. And I was looking to this. This is quite a, a strong statement uh, in the Gospels. Uh, but first of all, if we look to um, Isaiah, it's written there in 35 verses 5 to 6. Then will the eyes of the blind be open and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then will the lame leap, leap like a deer and the mute tongue shout for joy. Water will gush, from, uh, gush forth into the wilderness and streams in the desert. And when I think of the fulfillment, I think of uh, John the Baptist and the account in Matthew. And it says, when John, who was in prison, heard about the deeds of the Messiah, he sent the disciples to ask, are you the one who is to come? Or should we be expecting someone else? So this would have been the question. Is this the one, or are we to expect someone else? Jesus, are you the one? Are you here for some other task? And if we look back to Matthew 11, 2 to 6, Jesus replied, go back and report to John what you heard, hear and see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, and what does it say? The dead are, right, the dead are raised. And the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. See, the information's there, you know. This is the Messiah on a, on a cult going into Jerusalem. It, it, he's not a politician. He's not on a horse, a white horse going in, having celebrating victory or to take victory, victory to take rule back from Rome. He's come for another purpose. Lazarus has been raised. Jesus is in the vicinity. This natural tension, this naturally added to the tension also given to the Jewish belief, as I've already mentioned, in the resurrection of the dead in the last days, which is affirmed in the Maccabees. The Jews believe that only God could raise the dead. Lazarus, raising Lazarus on the fourth day was quite an indirect message that Jesus was God. And then we come on to the, the triumphal en entry. This ragtag band of followers accompanying a Galilean peasant riding on a donkey would have looked quite a parody. of a standard welcome and fed fanfare for governors and generals astride their white horses with an escort of soldiers. You know? 
we would expect a, a general on a white horse and to be accompanied by soldiers coming back from a victory or, or going into war. But here we have Jesus on the donkey, a symbol of peace. They, the crowds, line the roads with their garments and palms, date palms and Date palms are majestic tall trees. I know mine were only small. Any engineers amongst you might find that comedy come comical that uh, potentially I, I ordered in feet and got them in inches. But these are tall trees that grow abundantly in the Holy Land. Their long, large leaves spread out from the top of a single trunk that can grow up to more than 50 feet in height. In Bible times, the finest specimens grew in Jericho, which sim was symbolically known as the city of the palm trees in Gedi. And along the banks of the Jordan, they, they, they were there. Palm trees symbolize goodness, well-being, grandeur, steadfast, and victory. Palm trees were uh, regarded as tokens of joy and triumph and were customarily used on a festival, festival uh, occasions. Kings and conquerors were welcomed with palm branches, being strewn before them and waved in the air. Victors of Grecian games returned to their homes, triumphantly waving palm branches in their hands. And as we read on, the crowds cry, Hosanna, which is Hebrew for God save us. We can also think that possibly they were thinking it meant they were shouting, liberate us, liberate us from the Roman rule. And we look at the Psalms, it says, save us, we pray, O Lord, O Lord, we pray, give us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. And this was a psalm that was customarily sung on their ascent up to the, the temple mount. Jesus is making a deliberate messianic claim in that this behavior enacted the prophecy of Zechariah 9.9. The cult must be unridden, thus still pure and suitable for sacred purposes. Note that the cult would have been led by his mother, so there would have been two donkeys, hence clip-clop, clip-clop, clip-clop. There were two donkeys, two animals. Matthew also say that they brought the donkey and colt and put on their backs cloaks and he sat on them. In other words, the, the cloak, cloaks. And as we move on to verse 16, the crowd still, not, still do not understand that Jesus has come to his nation's capital to die and the, uh, re reigning, and the reigning king uh, and reigning as a king must be for a, a future day. You'll be aware that in the Gospels there's this there's this, uh, I'll use the phrase, there is a, an already but not yet overtone. The kingdom has been established, but it is yet to be consummated. Jesus establishes it in his first advent, but he's going to consummate it in his second. You know, uh, and they hadn't realized it, or hadn't, uh, their understanding hadn't developed to that level. The kingdom will be established spiritually, but it will only be consummated at the second advent of Jesus. Unlike the war horse, the donkey was an animal of peace and humility, and no Romans will be conquered this week. What a disappointment. No Romans are going to be conquered this week. It's like going to the Millennium Stadium uh, to play England and say, sorry guys, you've got a strong team, but we're going home. You, you know, tea's ready. You know, you imagine... The, the expectation that Jesus is going to raise up a, a liberation force to um, conquer the Romans. But no, he's come for a, another reason. He, he, he's come to die. You don't go to Twickenham to lose a game of rugby. Maybe that's a, a poor analogy, but I think you, you get what, what the excitement that was there. What I'm the spirit of what I'm trying to say. In fact, as we read, we see that Jesus not head, doesn't head for the Antonia Tower where the Romans established their power from. Instead, he heads to the temple. 
he, 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 <laughs> step, he heads to the temple, uh, has, he, he arrives there, has a look round, and then next day it, it all kicks off with the cleansing of the temple. And, and now he starts ruffling feathers, uh, the, the ruffling the feathers of the established religion. Luke also adds, Jesus laments that the people did not recognize his overtures of peace. A peace that was to be established from God to man. Later that week at the crucifixion, it was from God to man. And that's something that should warm your hearts, just that phrase. It was from God to man. Nothing that we did. <laughs> Praise God for that. Because if, if we did it, there would be no chance. It was what God did. It was his peace extended, extended from him uh, to, to us. As a result, the city can look forward only to its coming destruction in AD 70, about which Jesus discussed in the Mount of Olives. Little, little wonder that, the, 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 uh, that there was a change from shouts of joy for Jesus to shouts for his cruci uh, crucifixion as it became clear that Jesus was not going to support the political agenda of the time to overthrow the Romans and in fact threaten the power base of that political agenda in his mission to extend his family from being Jewish centric to Jewish and Gentile centric. Now if it wasn't for what Jesus did this week that we're remembering, we wouldn't be included. There would be no salvation for, for the, the Gentiles in the way that God had planned. Then finally, in verses 20 onwards, and this kind of brings us on to this evening's word, uh, and I guess the theme of this word this morning is that extension of salvation from being Israel-centric to being globally-centric. Is it This message doesn't belong to us as a church. It belongs to the community. It belongs to Wales. It belongs to the world. Because of what Jesus did I I this week that we, we remember. And we see that step progress as we look at the book of Acts. This propagation of the gospel from Jerusalem out through Samaria to the rest of the world. Okay, the rest of the world was Rome. But also the rest of the Rome world includes your homes. It includes Cliddock. It includes Wales. You know, and the message that we have a strong message, a strong message that's going to ruffle feathers. It's going to upset people. There is only one way back to the Father, and that's through Jesus Christ. You know, and our mission is to preach the Word of God. Just preach the Word of God and rely on the Holy Spirit to, 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 to convict and bring men and women into the kingdom. You know, and, and when we realize it, it's not down to us. And it's down to the Holy Spirit and all we have to do is to expound the scriptures to our neighbors, to the people we've left at home, the people in the streets. It makes life a lot easier. And then when we also realize that he's chosen people, when we hit the target on the head, when we preach the gospel to those he's called, we know for we're going to be successful. It is such an encouragement for evangelism to, to continue to propagate his word. But finally, here, some Greeks seek Jesus in verses 20 to 26. And this, as I said, leads us on anticipation to this, this evening's ser service. The Greeks, in other words, the Gentiles, were God-fearers. Non-Jews who had come, from Jeru uh, come to Jerusalem to worship at the Jewish festival. And this evening we'll consider one particular contender who could only be a God-fearer. He was drawn to God, but was excluded because he could not meet the strict 
requirements of becoming a proselyte. We're not thinking of Cornelius, we're thinking of the eunuch. And I've got to be careful, I don't see, get the word wrong, but Ethiopian eunuch. <laughs> I laugh because I, I was saying to Adriana that if, if I don't pay attention, I might, I might call him the European uh, eunuch. <laughs> the Ethiopian eunuch. So here we have a God-fearer, drawn to God, drawn to Jesus. They came to Philip, who we'll consider again tonight. And Philip went to Andrew. And they both went to Jesus, who effectually says that this is not the time for an audience, but rather for the event that would provide salvation for all people. The Greeks, the God-fearers, Cornelius and the eunuch, all those who have been excluded. Praise God, those who have been excluded by the law were now included. What a, a message of inclusion. You know, it, where I work now, EDI is the thing. You know, equality, diversity, inclusion. Here we see inclusion. The eunuch, because of his physical position, could not be included as a proselyte. He was a god -fearer. He went to Jerusalem to worship. He had a call on his life, an irresistible call on his life. He, he went there, but he couldn't be part of the club. <laughs> but now, because of what a Jesus did, those rules have been removed. And he could now be part of the club. Because what Jesus did on the cross. So Jesus now is saying, it, it's no longer the time for uh, signs and wonders, so to speak. It's a time for action. For so long, Jesus has said, it, 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 it's not the right time. It's not the right time to do what I've come here to do. But there are other things I need to be doing. But now it's a case of the time has come for that major mission for me to complete and stop with these other things to convince you of who I am. The, the things I needed to do, I've done. Now I've got to go and provide the way back to reunite my creation back to the Father. And that's effectively what Jesus is saying in these verses. It's time for action. You know, and sometimes we can say that as a church. It's time for action. Time to go out and preach the gospel and tell people what Jesus has done for the God-fearers. You know, we're not an exclusive club. We're inclusive. Jesus did this for all. Okay, we've got to take into consideration the, the context of unival universalism. I won't go into that just yet, but, you know, he came for all. For so long, Jesus had been saying, now is the time. But the time had now come for the glorification of the Son of Man. And we read that on beyond this reading, verses 23 to 30. Jesus saying, no to the revolt against Rome, but that death must proceed victory, as it seems to be with seeds that go into the ground, which then die and then grow into plants and trees. His death will bring judgment against his opponents, but the opportunity of salvation for all who will allow themselves to be drawn to him. The lifting up of Jesus in his crucifixion will lead to Christ's exaltation, both to save and to judge in complete accordance with the Father's will. And this is the anticipation. This is the anticipation that I, I want to, us to go away from this place this morning. On Palm Sunday... You know, it's not just a tradition of the year. Let's get back into the, the spirit of what has been read in the scriptures, the excitement, the passion that the, the children were demonstrating this morning, putting the, the passion back into the word. 
and that hope, that hope for the future. You know, the victory over sin, the victory over sin that Jesus is going to perform on the cross on Friday and we're going to celebrate. And then come on Sunday, this wasn't, you know, Jesus proved himself with the resurrection. You know, he, he died and he rose again. And I pray next week, church, that you, you will be shouting hallelujah, praise the Lord. And this week, you'll carry that ex- excitement and expectation back home with you into your work tomorrow or whatever you need to do tomorrow, the environment that you'll be. This is the week that we're remembering where Jesus rode on a donkey into Jerusalem, not to conquer the system, but to conquer our problem with God. Or God's problem with us, and that's our sinful nature. And then what he's going to do on Friday that we're going to celebrate was to break that and to perform that, the atonement uh, uh, and reestablish our relationship back to the Father. And then uh, on Sunday, you know, whoever we're telling, you know, the excitement, we're going to be celebrating his resurrection, that he came back to life. Proving who he was, you know, that he's the second member of the Trinity, you know, fully God, fully human, two natures, one person. This wasn't just an ordinary man. This was the second member of the Trinity we're celebrating this this week. And what he did, what he came to do, his mission from the Father. Uh, And I pray that as we go away this morning... You'll be filled with that excitement and that passion. To, to, in the same way you'd go out and cheer for Wales in the Millennium Stadium, with that passion, come on, you'd go out and say, this is the passion I have for the Lord, for what he's done for me. And I believe that that's What I've been led this morning to to light, so to speak. Try and remind ourselves of that passion and encourage us to be passionate in the in the week coming.